Uh, very good afternoon to you wherever you are. Uh, welcome to Manchester and Northwest District's uh, IOSH branch event. It's the first Tuesday in the month again, and I'm delighted I'm back chairing it. Um, this time as the chair of East Lancashire District, who have organised today's session. Um, we always like to find something new and bring something new to the table, and uh, I'm delighted to be able to do that today. And I'm not going to say too much of an introduction other than that Matthew Bradbury and uh, Shell Stephenson are here from a company called Atensi, who uh, are looking at um, developing um, or are developing a worldwide renowned uh, gamified learning platform. Um, I'm not even going to try and explain that. I know when I looked at it, I thought this could be the future. So it's with absolute delight I welcome both you gentlemen to our session. I'm going to hand it over to you, Matt. Thanks, Chris. And give me one second. I've just started sharing my screen. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can hear clearly. Fantastic. Well, thanks a lot, everyone, for being here today. We're really excited to share with you a little bit more around gamified simulation training. Um, and I'm just going to do a quick intro to myself. Uh, so I'm Matt. I, my background is in management consulting and I've been with Attendee now for around about a year uh, where I spent a bit of time in sales, but have recently transitioned into a new data of di uh, director of data analytics role. Uh, what we hear often in the training industry is there's a greater need for really unpicking and understanding what, what is really driving behavioral change. And we use a lot of the data analytics that we collect using our learning platform to do that um, and I'm also um, going to hand you over to quickly to Shell to uh, give you a quick intro to, to his role as well. Thank you Matt and thanks Chris for having us. Uh, my name is uh, Shell, I'm heading up the energy industry and marine sector here at Atensi. Also worked on a lot of the projects uh, related to HSC culture and, and knowledge and, and, um, and competence uh, development. So look forward to telling you a bit more about that. Thank you. And, and so why are we here today? Um, and really, uh, first thing you got to know about Tenzi and, and the work that we've been doing in this space is it really spans across uh, not just health and safety, but a much broader topic. But, but we do do a lot of work within the health and safety industry. And we find and what we hear on the ground from HC, uh, HC professionals and L&D &D leaders alike is that there are a significant number of challenges faced when trying to deliver behavioral change. Some of those challenges are specific to health and safety, um, but others are more broadly understood in the learning industry. One of the things that we hear time and time again in HSEs in particular is that often training that we deliver as an industry is not specifically designed to address the cultural aspects of HSE. Like, for example, how to address issues with colleagues when there are those situations that are on the line or how to effectively participate in a toolbox talk. What we often hear is actually, in fact, that most of the training is very compliance based and isn't really driving that effectual change. And as a result, people are seeing HSE um, as something that is someone else's problem rather than that is something, a collective issue that we're all equally responsible for in the workplace. When we look more broadly across um, across the L&D industry, what, what we see is actually some issues that are also in HSE are, are much broader. For example, with the new, the new generation coming through, we often hear that they speak a different language. The tools that we used yesterday are not breaking through today. And also, there's a much greater interest in really understanding how, uh, how people are interacting with the trainings that are being delivered, not just for measuring compliance. This is something that is still very important, but also understanding and unpicking the specific areas where are people struggling and then using that information to address uh, and learn further. And so what? Well, Shell, Andre and myself, we believe that there's a better way, a better way to train, to learn and to change, ultimately change behavior. And we, what we're gonna talk about today is what we call gamified simulation training. And this is something that is high impact training that employees love and come back to time and time again. And if we break that down, we got the gamified and we've got simulation. So with simulation, what, what is a simulation? Well, in its core, what we would say is it's really an imitation of a conversation. You could have a, it could, it could be a conversation with a colleague, could be a workflow, it could be a process. And simulation in training means that you're training in an environment 
um, and situations that are similar as possible to your everyday context that you have. That makes it real for users. And one thing that we should all be aware of is this isn't a new idea. Pilots have been training in simulators for almost as long as uh, there have been planes. And surgeons have been training on cadavers and leading the way in simulation training. But don't worry, I'm not going to put cadavers in your workplaces and suggest that as the right way to do training going forwards. But why, why do people use simulations? But at, at its core, it's really about having a safe space to try things out and ultimately to fail and try again. One really powerful story in this space is the episode from the, uh, the Hudson River. Some of you may have seen the film with Tom Hanks um, called Sully. And in this, in, this, in, in this story, what happened was, it's a true story, they took off from a, an, air, um, an airport in New York and the geese got stuck in the engine, in both engines, in fact. So they lost total engine power. But in a, in a few seconds, the pilot, Sully, he decided that the best landing uh, course of action was to land on the Hudson River. That seems like an illogical choice. Um, and in fact, the courts have many issues with trying to decipher why that was the right reason. And in fact, the insurance companies who didn't want to pay out also had a strong opinion on this. But really, when you break that down, is he had trained time and time again in the flight simulator. He knew how to land on, uh, on the river safely. He'd done it a thousand times before. Um, and when he did it in practice, thankfully, um, it was it, it was a safe execution and he kept calm and that that was the right thing to do. But in contrast, if you think about the people and we've all been on a, on a flight and watched the videos telling you that you need to, if we do a landing on water, we're going to reach underneath your seat and pull out the life jacket and make sure we put it over your head, but don't inflate it when you come out. If you look at the images from that day, you see that only four of the 150 people actually went out with the life jacket on over their head. 30 of the 150 were carrying them, thankfully, but then a staggering 120 of those folks didn't even have their life jacket. So they were stood out there and they could have drowned in what was a very cold day in New York. It's quite a scary uh, fact, but really this is a tale of two different ways of training. One, you're learning by doing in a simulation and we're able to practice over and over again to embed the learnings. And then secondly, the tale of more of a passive learning. Watching a video, you might do a quiz at the end. Um, it, it's very much the style of learning that you do with e-learning. And you can see, hopefully, which one is the more effective method. And again, if we get academic for a moment, this is something that we see in the, in the learning development literature. It's called Ed, Edgar Dale's kind of experience. Some of you may have seen this before, but really there are two types of learning. You have what we call passive learning and then also active learning. And it's basic common sense. Learning by doing is the most effective way of learning. Um, and the passive old, old hat learning techniques of reading, hearing, just seeing or watching a video and doing a quiz, don't cut the mustard. You need, to, you need to either participate in a discussion or simulate in a real experience. So that breaks down the first component of what we consider to be game, gamified simulation training. The next thing we want to, to, uh, that we want to share with you today is really another perspective on what is gamification and what is game-based training. They're two subtly different things. And we think that the second one Game-based training is the most effective way uh, to learn. Most of you will have heard about gamification. It's been a big buzzword in the industry for the past few years. Um, we often see it now combined in e-learning. Um, you might watch the film, the PDF, or the PowerPoint, and then do the quiz. And at the end, you'll get um, a points, stars, or a leaderboard put on a leaderboard. And there is a, a reason for that. You know, we, we, we see and, and what the, the science tells us is that you get a dopamine kick. Uh, it's a bit like drinking alcohol or drinking a can of Coke. Um, you're getting that kick and that feels good. It feels good to get the points and you may even get some light competition in there. The difference with game-based training is where we make the entire training a game, a bit like a video game. It's nothing that you passively consume and then do a quiz at the end. Everything is the game. And in order to, as you navigate through this game, 
all of the learning is active. You're participating, you're actively doing things, you're making choices about prioritizations, for example. And that's how we go from basic psychology with gamification through to cutting through to those next levels of more advanced psychology with game-based training. And for the, for the mums and dads in the room, you're probably freaking out by looking at this slide. You probably have, have heard of the likes of, of Fortnite and Minecraft and, and your children are uh, you know, enjoying those so much. But if we take a step back for a moment, everyone in this room knows a gamer, even if you don't have kids. Um, the, the old perspective of what a gamer was, was the, the, the male teenager who was locked up in a dark room he might have had pizza leftovers on one side and then a whole scattering of drinks on the other. But the truth is now is that the average gamer is about 35 and the average for men is, is slightly actually younger than, than, than for women. And but overall, the split between male and female is around 50, 50 percent. And what's going on here is those old games being on PC and Xboxes and Playstations and um, that still exists. But really now there's been a huge transition to mobile and we see people playing candy crush solitaire chess on their phones and it's it's now a concept that really works for the adult um, experience and for the adult workforce but when you when you take that to the next level when you want to look at bringing video game design you need to have a more advanced approach to training what makes different games good is quite different for example what makes a, sh a shooting game quite attractive is very different from what makes something like Minecraft attractive um, because you, you, one might have a very good narrative that flows and another might be giving you more creativity and opportunity to explore different avenues. And you, what we try to bring with game-based game learning is finding the right game approach, the right game mechanics to suit your needs. It's not just about points and leaderboards anymore. We look at those next level opportunities and what, what we will, we want to get to ultimately is find the right balance to keep people's attention by adding challenge as you go. This could look like different things. It might be if you're having a conversation um, with uh, someone who's new, how do you build trust with that person? How do you establish that trust so that they can talk about a health and safety accident that, that's occurred? Or if you're in a situation where there's just been an accident and you've got you're under time pressure to make a phone call to speak to uh, the emergency services or the internal emergency uh, teams at, at a plant for example we can add time pressure to that adds another dimension that goes one step beyond this just passive learning techniques of, of, of the past and what's the results of this well again it's a tale of two different ways of training with game-based learning we see very different behavioral output and best practice adoption than you would with passive learning techniques. And so the white line, what you're seeing here, is much more of what the passive learning techniques achieves. When you, when you do that type of learning, you do see some initial uh, adoption of best practice, uh, but very quickly that fades away. People will forget they, they don't yeah, monitor the behavior. Sometimes we hear that that's a week, sometimes it's a matter of days. But with game-based learning, and putting that in a simulated way, we're able to, to get people to repeat. And by going over and over again, using the different advanced game mechanics, you're able to unlock that repetition. And then ultimately we see that translate to real world behavior. And we've got many examples of how that can be achieved with our team today. And Shell Andre will be talking through that, many of that, much of that with you. Shell Andre, over to you. Thanks, Matt. So if you could do next, Slide, please. Thank you. First of all, I just want to tell you a couple of words about uh, who Atensi are. Now, please, <laughs> please excuse my my English. It's not my first language, but uh, so if I miss some words, please uh, please bear with me. Uh, could you do the next slide, uh, please, Matt? So we are a Norwegian company, and uh, it was founded by two people: one person who came from the e-learning industry, and another person who came from the gaming industry. And what they wanted to do, they wanted to look at how they can make training and learning more engaging. So we started out doing that in 2012, and we're still doing that today. We're located in, in, uh, out of Oslo in, in Norway, uh, and then we have the, an office in, in the UK, and we're also are opening an office in, in Boston. And we are delivering solutions all over the world. We have delivered more than 450 simulators, 
and we have a hundred plus corporate customers. We do a lot of work in the in the public area and health. Uh, we do a lot of work on uh, industrial areas and also in the energy area. In some of our customers, you can see down on, on the left hand side, which are customers that we serve globally. Next one, please. Uh, three uh, key elements was impo were important to us when we started out doing this. The first one was that it needed the training needed to be realistic, and that goes back to what Matt was talking about earlier. It needs to be transferable to what you're actually going to do. So that is about the tasks that you're doing, but it's also about the tone of voice, the look, the feel. So if we are doing, for instance, if we're doing leadership training for a retail company, it will be completely different than what we are doing for uh, an energy company, given that the employees and the challenges are different. So we want to make it as realistic as possible to have the transferability of the knowledge that you're actually gaining. Also, it needs to be gamified. And the reason it needs to be gamified is that we see that uh, the gamification and game-based learning drives repetition. And if there were, were a better way to drive repetition, we would do that. But we have found that gamification and game-based learning is the best way of driving this. So you could, you could look at game, the gamified element as everything that is fun about the, the solutions that we make. But lastly, we look at an impact. So what are we trying to do? When we make our games, well, the first thing we do, we look at what is the learning goal of this. And then we start walking backwards and say, okay, so given these learning goals, this is what we, this is the solution that we are going to build, and this is the, the tech that we're going to use. Now, one example of, of picking up the, the, the data points from, from the solutions that we make is, for instance, in an HSC gear game that we just made on reporting. So we saw that uh, we want to increase the, the reporting. We made a game based on that. And within six weeks, we saw a 300 percentage uh, increase in the reporting rates. Another one is one we made for compliance, where we saw that the, the players typically played for 48 minutes to get certified in this uh, compliance training. And after they were certified, they played 52 minutes more. So they actually played more after certification than before. Now then, that's a testament to also the gamification element that we are managing to drive that repetition, but also that we are managing to measure that, that, uh, that level of competence afterwards. Uh, next one, please, Matt. Now, we built a technology platform that we uh, develop our games on. And within HSC, typically what we use is the, the one on the left-hand side that we call behavior and the one uh, called skills. Uh, the behavioral uh, uh, product is, is the, the more immersive uh, training. We will show you some examples of that afterwards. But where you can typically, for instance, Matt mentioned that you can walk around the plants uh, you could interact with uh, with with the uh, with people uh, and, and dilemmas and 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 uh, different tasks around the plant. Uh, we do this, for instance, we also do VR training for for uh, for exposure therapy. Uh, a, a broad range of of trainings that we can do that are really immersive. So, for instance, if you do leadership development also within the HSC field, we typically use those solutions to go get really deep into the conversations. And you can use then uh, a behavioral frameworks as, as a base of this. We will show you some exa examples of this afterwards. And then we have the skills, which is then the mobile first, uh, also available uh, to, to play on all platforms, of course. But here we typically have a focus on more on the knowledge side as well as the behavioral side. But we see that we can also drive behavioral change through those. So a lot of the compliance uh, stuff we, use, uh, we do and also the trainings we do on that, uh, we do on the mobile phone. So for instance, uh, for, for HSE training, for, uh, uh, for handling equipment, uh, where you have a knowledge uh, uh, base that you need, uh, we have a big variation in the, in, in the typical types of tasks that you do, uh, but you also have the behavioral element uh, where you need to apply that knowledge in situations. So how would you act uh, uh, in a situation where you, where you are uh, stuck in, for instance, in a dilemma as to how to handle a situation? Uh, and then we also do the, the process training, which is more IT centric. So for instance, use adoption of new IT systems. We have a portal, which we could use as a, as a learning journey uh, to launch all this. 
And then we have also the creator tool, which is our author tool, what we use to make our games, which we also make available for a lot of our customers who want to make their own games. So really democratizing the, the game making there. Uh, next one, please, uh, Matt. So what does this look like in practice? Uh, now, games are very visual, uh, and we thought we would show you a couple of videos to give you an impression of what this would look like. So the first video we're going to show you is from a, a customer of ours who are uh, called Hydro. So they're an uh, aluminum making uh, company uh, as, uh, based out of Norway, uh, but located all over the world. So please, Matt. Hydro is continually improving and innovating the methods they use to improve the safety of its employees and visitors at their plants. One of their latest innovations is a gamified training from a smartphone app to a full 3D simulation. The training is built to accelerate the learning curve and the feeling of role mastery. The simulation is built around realistic role play where the players need to handle a range of typical but challenging situations that they are likely to face at a hydro plant. As you move through the simulation, you will experience a realistic 3D environment of the different areas of a hydro plant, with its unique challenges and safety risks. You will have to continuously evaluate dangers and try to stay in the green zone. The mobile app focuses on building knowledge and competence about HSC in hydro and is the onboarding of all employees and visitors to hydro's facilities worldwide. Through the different questions, you will learn about basic HSE and how to stay safe when working at or visiting the plant. The training modules are bite-sized. This makes it convenient for employees to train whenever they have a spare moment in their work day. By using game mechanics like points, instant feedback, hints and starts, we get employees deeply engaged with the learning. And if you are really good, you will earn your position on a global leaderboard. These mechanics drive voluntary repetition, which increase the learning effect and experience even further. All content is developed by Hydro Safety representatives from primary metal production sites to ensure realistic content, true to the Hydro HSE principles and rules. The feedback so far from everyone who has played is that this feels like a game changer and a fantastic new innovative way to further strengthen Hydro's HSE culture and improve the training on HSE. Are you up for the challenge? Let the games begin. Thank you. Uh, so what we saw here was a combination of, of, of several of, of our, our solutions. Now the first one is we've made a, a mobile uh, game for them. And this is actually used as a certification tool for uh, all entry uh, to their factories around the world. So if you get to a hydro site, you need to download a game, play it and, and show the security guards that you are certified in the HSC hydro knowledge uh, to be able to get into the plant. Uh, the other one is a 3D simulation, which is based on, on their, uh, their uh, the critical 70 fatality risks um, on their HSC uh, culture in hydro. So it's based on their own methodology. And what we done there is we build up, so like there is a main goal of, of, of the game where you interact with your colleagues, you, you move about. You also saw that there was an accident, for instance, where a colleague is hit by a car. How do you act in that situation? So we put a lot of, um, we put a lot of use of a lot of game, uh, gamification elements to drive that uh, experience and also a lot of feelings. So when you can get emotions into the game, it really makes the knowledge stick ex extra well. So for instance, uh, you have accidents with colleagues, you have colleagues who have dilemmas uh, that you need to, to help them with as, a, as a, for instance, as a manager, which is really able to drive that, uh, that knowledge, uh, knowledge building and also behavioral change. Uh, the next one, please, Matt. Uh, what we want to show you now is, is a short video uh, from Equinor. It's a Norwegian energy company. Now, this video is in Norwegian, uh, but it, is, it does have uh, subtitles. So growing up in, in Norway, I always watched English movies with Norwegian subtitles. So, so you will get a, a small glimpse into, into the Norwegian way of watching uh, movies. But uh, a short video as to what we are doing with Equinor. Please, Matt. 
forskning viser at simuleringsbasert trening gjennom spill gir høyere motivasjons- og læringseffekt enn de tradisjonelle læringsmetoder. Vi i prosjektet Spillbasert trening har nå utviklet en spillapp basert på realistiske scenarioer du kan bli mot med i din jobb. Spillet er gøy, motiverende og engasjerende. Se hva dine kolleger mener om spillet. Første gangen jeg hørte at vi skulle begynne å bruke spill, så tenkte jeg at det kan bli spennende, for det har vi ikke prøvd før. Og det er noe som ungdommen liker. Det jeg likte best med treningen var at det var noe helt nytt. Det var et spill, og det har jeg aldri prøvd før i jobbsammenheng. Ja, klart jeg kan. Et litt øyeblikk her. Og det å spille et HMS-spill er med på å gjøre at vi får trent oss på en annen måte, og det tror jeg er viktig. Jeg har opplevd at spillet var relevant og realistisk. Du kjenner deg veldig att i situasjonen. Det var artig det. Det å ta egne valg i treninger oppleves så spennende. Treningen av den synes jeg var veldig bra, for det at du ble med i spillet, og du måtte gjøre en innsats for å komme videre. For at jeg skal få lyst til å spille igjen, så må det være interessant. Og det synes jeg det var med den nærende konkurransen. Greia med at du får bedre og bedre skår etter hver som du spiller. Jeg lærer vel bedre hvis du prøver til en vestrad. Men mengdetrening er det jo bedre. Så må vi passe fingrene her, tenker jeg. Ja, dere får heller stoppe meg om dere får fort. Jeg mener at denne treningen passer for veldig mange. Både om du har jobbet lenge, eller om du er helt ny i bedriften. Equinors ambisjon er å bli industrilederne inne på HMS. Vi har alle et ansvar for å bidra til å oppnå dette målet. Vi liker med, engasjerer deg og konkurrer med dine kolleger for å utvikle og teste dine ferdigheter. Lykke til med spillet! Thank you, Matt. Next, please. There we go. So, uh, and again, uh, for, for, uh, for Equinor, uh, what we've done is we've taken their uh, methodology around safety behavior. They have a, a wheel that's called Always Safe, a, 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 quarterly, uh, a quarterly approach to, to different uh, themes around, uh, around safety. And the first game was on, on, the, on the preventing of, of personal uh, injuries. Um, and this is a, a very, uh, it's, a, it's a realistic game. It's based on a lot of the knowledge part. And we also saw that what they did is actually, um, the, some of the feedback was that it was really well, um, well received, not only on, for their offshore staff, but also for their onshore staff and really understanding the value chain of what they are actually doing as a, as a, as a company. And, and the situation that we, we set forth here was, uh, was um, uh, the installation of, of a pump and you need to then apply the right knowledge and uh, behavior to be able to do this without ac accidents. And uh, it's, a, it's a really, uh, and they made it in a way that it's a, it's a, it's a very hard game. You don't get much feedback. Uh, but this is also something that, that our, our customers can choose how they want to build up. If you take the next one, please, Matt. Uh, the, the final example we want to show you today is uh, 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 a game that we made with a company called Safer, uh, formerly Propel. Uh, and this is a consulting company that have developed their own offshore uh, behavioral uh, model, which is, uh, is valid and, and reliable. Uh, and we have then uh, applied our technology and methodology with their uh, behavioral framework and then built solutions based on that. So there are both uh, mobile games and, and, and deeper simulations uh, that we have made for that. And, and one of the instances uh, we, we delivered on that uh, with them was for, for the company called K-Line and they really needed to see uh, an increase in, in reporting and the feedback has been very good because you really get to Again, you, you, you specify the behaviors and the knowledge based on the situations that are realistic to the people tra uh, training it. So it's directly transferable to the K-Line uh, personnel. So these are some of the examples uh, we want to show you in, in, uh, on, on, a, on a broad level today. Uh, and then uh, we would like to open up for, for, for questions here at the, at the back end and, uh, and hopefully answer your questions uh, if, you, if you have them. Thanks. Thanks, Joe and Matt. 
<clears throat> where's Ashley? I think Ashley's got some questions from the chat for you. Um, I, I've got one. Is, is this solution just for big businesses or this, can this be used across a wide range of size of businesses? So it, it definitely can be used uh, across a wide range of businesses. So we have, we have customers who have uh, uh, 150 employees and we have customers who have 150,000 employees. So it, 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 it is, uh, it is uh, scalable uh, both up and down uh, depending on, on your needs. Okay, Ash, over to you. Thanks, Chris. And uh, thanks ever so much for the, the presentation, Matt and Michelle. Um, a couple of questions here. So is the training philosophy, this is from Lee Bright, is the training philosophy based on the crew resource management approach, which is being adopted in the offshore industry? Uh, so the training philosophy is, um, so how should we put this? So, so, so from our, our uh, from our point of view, we have the methodology of game of gamified the learning and simulation, and then we have the technology, and really the the um, the the approach in regards to the kind of the behavior you want to see that depends on the customer. So we showed you, for instance, Hydro. They have their own safety behavioral framework, and then Hydro and, I, and Equinor have their own, and Safer have their own. So it's really agnostic to the approach that you would have as, as a company. So I, I, I'm not familiar with the crew research management approach, but but if that's a, a, a if that's a, a framework of uh, of behavior, HSC behavior, that could definitely be applied to our solutions as well. Great, thank uh, you. And just extending uh, that, if, <clears throat> if it's helpful, um, you know, a lot of our work isn't just in HSC. We, we also work in other industries beyond HSC, and that's because the the platform that we've created is is very flexible and allows you to work across those those different platforms, frameworks, and and, and what have you. Um, and so we can make any situation uh, we we say any situation sort of uh, be reflected in, in in that platform environment. That's great. Thank you. Um, another couple of questions around process safety. So from the chemical industry, how does the platform and attendancy uh, tackle the process safety questions? So typically what we do is, is we focus on, on, the, on the knowledge bit uh, and the behavioral bit. So in regards to more the technical side of things, uh, that, that's not what we, what we specialize in. Um, so for instance, for, uh, for, for process training, we would then focus on the knowledge, uh, on, uh, so the, you could call it technical knowledge uh, for, of the process, and then uh, typically the behavioral. So how would you approach that from a process side, uh, but not necessarily the technical application of the process, if that makes sense. It does, sounds great, thank you. And then one last question. What's the timeline in terms of how quickly can a training session be developed? Uh, so I, I can take this one, Shell, if, it, if it's helpful. Um, so typically what we would say is, um, depending on which products you use, if you're looking somewhere from around eight to 12 weeks is sort of a typical timeline that we look for for the first project. Um, although uh, Shell mentioned that so we have a creator tool and we have many customers using this, where they are, once the first product is in place, they can create additional modules, additional trainings, um, you know, in, the, in a matter of hours or, or, or you know, or a day. Um, quite quite easily. Um, so the, the initial project it usually takes a while initial setup because you've got to get things right like the um, the right data agreements in place, the IT stuff set up. Um, but then once that's all in place, then building additional content on top of that, if it's done by yourselves, is, is there. Um, it, is, it can be quite simple um, because the because the the way that the training is built in the platform is highly customized to a customer's specific needs and, and their specific frameworks. What we aim to do with that is we work closely with, um, we have a team of um, experienced content designers and game game content authors. They work closely with subject matter experts on, on the customer side to firstly codify what are the key learnings that you're looking for to solve the problem that you're looking to, to, to resolve, um, you know, be it more reporting. And then, and then break that down into the, the key moments of truth. So, for example, if it's, if it's about a, a culture of reporting in the business, then there are certain situations, for example, where you're on that gray line with someone when you, ha when you have a conversation with someone on the shop floor. Um, 
what, what, how do I approach that conversation? How do I help encourage them to report an incident? Um, that can be a very relevant uh, situ situation that we've created multiple times. Um, and we can use our experience and how we've approached that and how we approach different games and bring that to the table as well. But yeah, you're looking roughly for the first projects around eight, eight to 12 weeks. Great, that's question. Thanks, Pat. Um, two other uh, questions come in. One from uh, Vincent Stop. What sort of costs are involved in getting the program up and running, please? Yeah, so um, I can take some of the shell. Maybe you take the, the other one around the, the hydro uh, example. But um, so in terms of the typical cost, what we would say is you're looking for, depending on the program. So you have seen the the and the the skills application, which is the mobile first app where you're looking to build skills and knowledge. And we bring in different dialogues to help bring that contextual awareness of a particular situation. For that, you're looking into low five figures, um, whereas for the more advanced um, simulations, you could be pushing into uh, into six figure. Um, just into the low six figures uh, to develop that that kind of uh, game, um, and that in that instance we do find that typically we work with larger companies for those fully immersive three uh, D simulations. But uh, for the the, the the smaller ones, we, like Shelter, we still see very strong behavioural impacts through those, um, and so that is often uh, where our sort of medium small to medium enterprises uh, work with us. On. That's great, thank you. And from Dave Nightingale. Uh, how much effect do the system have on incident statistics at Hydro? Um, have you got available data you can share with the new NDA? Hmm. I've added the NDA bit, by the way. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, um, no, uh, sorry, we don't have the data to share on that on, on that side, thanks. Uh, in a different conversation, we could share some, some, some more insights. Um, but uh, what we see is typically and it's difficult, right? Because you're trying to prevent something. Uh, so the measurement is, is typically difficult. But what we see is, is really good. Um, um, so a good, um, sorry, uh, again, that, there we go with the language. So a, a good way of measuring is, for instance, the reporting. So if you want to do something really concrete, uh, we want to have a reporting of this type of, of behavior. We want to increase that. And we saw that, for instance, with, with K-Line, uh, to a great degree, with the, the reporting that they wanted to get up went up uh, a lot. We also saw that the, uh, we measured the repetitions. So they had a lot of repetitions. They played the game, uh, which is simulated into the behavior that they actually want to see. So if you think, okay, they're doing the behavior, they're doing it a lot of times, and the reporting is going up, I think that's a strong, strong testament to effects. Um, if, if that answers your questions to some <coughs> degree, uh, Dave. I, I could add one thing to that as well, uh, Shalindra, which is um, <coughs> the, um, the, the the Hydra example was very focused around the most severe incidents and the biggest, um, you know, fatal accidents, which for those accidents you're talking about, maybe uh, one every year, maybe a couple of years that they've had historically. Um, and so measuring, you know, if there is one this year versus and not having one this year, is that a success of the simulation? And and that's something that we're constantly asking ourselves, like, how do we measure success? How do, how, how do we measure behavioral change? And for, for what Shell has said is that what we've found to be the best measure with, uh, with Hydro is to measure these other statistics around uh, around reporting as, as sort of being the key area that they focused on because being aware of the near misses um, helps helps us address the root causes of those problems and drive then the next wave of learning for those teams. Um, and it also demonstrates a meaningful shift in behavior and the way that they're thinking and approaching health and safety um, that we're, you know, we're pleased to see great successes in across our clients. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. Thanks so, so much, gents. That's, uh, that's the end of the question. So Thanks a lot. I, I just opened it up if there's anybody else on the session has any other questions or you'd like to uh, to look at this in a little bit more detail. Uh, I'm sure uh, Matt or uh, Shell would be more than happy to take some direct questions. I know everybody's shy today. They haven't got the video on, but um, that's not a problem. Are there any... Any other questions that anybody would like to ask? Silence. We've stunned them already. I, I, I think one of the questions I've got is, is, is this 
is this gamification a young person's game? Is, you know, is this is this aimed at the uh, up and coming um, generations, or do you see this fitting across all age ranges, not wanting to be in any way ageist? Um, I've got one example for this. I'm not sure if you've got a, a good example that you want, you'd like to share from you. So maybe if we answer both. Um, so uh, I, this is, this example was not um, a specific health and safety simulation, but it was an onboarding solution for a, a well-known um, eatery in the UK, and that covered uh, it was an onboarding journey uh, for all new employees of this company, um, and it covered things like food safety in there for sure, as you would expect in onboarding uh, things from a compliance standpoint, but another number of cultural topics. Um, and with that simulation, what we saw is the people that played it the most were uh, were women over the age of 45, and uh, they were playing it in their own time on the weekends um, and competing with each other, um, which is really exciting. Um, that there are, of course, as you would expect, with uh, you know, especially when you get to more of the the, um, the the higher age demographic, you do what we typically find is they have a trouble. They have maybe have slightly more of a challenge getting into the game, like figuring out mobile apps, getting into the app for the first time. But once they're in, actually, with with this particular foodie tree, once they were in the game, they actually had the highest engagement. Those were the ones that put the most time into training, and that might reflect some of the other learning methods that you you've got today. But we see exactly that same behavior. Those actually are the people that play the most um, once they've overcome any initial technical challenges. Um, you know, but we're talking of a difference of a couple of percent between the different age groups uh, there. Thank you. I think that answers as well. I mean, what we also do, we try to 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 get the we want to get get the right what we call the flow state. You want to get find the sweet spot between challenging and mastery, right? So we're also we're always calibrating, uh, and when we make for if we make yeah, a training for a, for a, a target audience that is typically uh, so let's say uh, twenty years old, we will tweak the game a little bit to maybe it's a little bit faster, um, and but but those are the the mechanics that we we can just tweak. But in regards to engagement, as, as Matthew is saying, it, we don't see any difference. This is uh, this is this uh, this works for for all ages okay. and all backgrounds as well. Brilliant. Right. Well, it's a short session today, folks, and I know everybody's busy. And uh, you know, unless there are any other questions, um, it goes without saying. I'd like to thank Matt and Shell for the time today. I know it's been a while in planning this, Matt, and uh, it came around eventually. Um, but it, uh, it is something different. It is uh, a different ask, a different look at uh, something different in terms of the health and safety world that we're living in. And if anybody does have uh, an interest or it sparks an interest, um, Matt uh, will be more than happy to pick that up offline. Um, you'll be able to get them from uh, the Atensi website, but uh, also we will be posting video from today and uh, the presentation as well online when uh, we get those things together. Helen's going to get that done for us. Um, so thank you very much uh, to the both of you. And uh, hopefully, uh, you know, I'm sure there'll be some conversations. Unfortunately, there's one guy who was on the call and he disappeared just as I was going to see if I could drag him in. Um, a guy called Dave Foy from, uh, he actually is with Preston, um, I'm sorry, UCLan at Preston. And he's been working with a bunch of young people um, on what they call the Locker Project, which is all about developing health and safety training and that for young people through education and that. And I thought Dave might have been a really good guy to have a chat with because it's uh, it's an interesting subject for him. Um, maybe he'll pick that up later. I, I will I will catch up with Dave possibly this evening. So, right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your time today. I'm going to call this close for the session on behalf of. East Lancashire District and the Manchester branch. Uh, please stay safe and we'll catch you on the next one.